Uh, good morning. I'm um, really delighted to be here. And uh, when I was uh, invited, I um, jumped at the chance because uh, there are things that I think right now that I hope to be able to say. Being at NCAI this year in Portland is a particular honor for me for several reasons. Uh, one is um, when I was a kid, I used to spend time here in Portland with uh, a man I called Uncle, George P. Levada. And uh, he was a remarkable guy, and he just loved to tell stories about NCAI in its early days, and it's important. I sent a draft of this. I was going to tell a, a quite a bit more about George and uh, about some things that happened at NCAI when I was young. And I sent a draft to this to a friend of mine, uh, Chuck Trimble, who uh, sent me back a note and said, forget the personal stuff, just get into it. Uh, this is an important message. So with that, I am just going to get into it. Th three years ago, my life changed pretty dramatically. I was uh, the editor of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, the editorial page, and uh, the company decided that the paper was going to go away and uh, my job with it. This was a great opportunity. I really had an opportunity to do whatever I wanted from then on. I was handed a blank sheet of paper, which is about the ideal setting for a writer. The hot issue of that moment was healthcare reform. And one of the great things about being on an editorial page board is that you're briefed by really the top experts in the field. The very people who are developing the outlines of healthcare reform would come and talk to us and uh, give us briefings about what they were trying to do. I would always ask them the same question. So how does the Indian health system fit into your thinking about healthcare reform? And every time, instead of a response, I'd get a blank stare. The experts, the very brightest people working on this, had not considered the implications to the Indian health system nor had they done anything to see what lessons might apply to the larger discourse. So I took my blank page and I set out to answer my own question. I was given a fellowship with the Kaiser Family Foundation and was fortunate because first they gave me eight months and then another six months to write about health care reform and its impact on Indian country. During that fellowship, I had this odd idea that and I was lucky because I had a source of income. But if I could just write and give everything away for free, what kind of audience would I create? And I say again, I'm fortunate because uh, that meant my columns were picked up by a wide variety of newspapers, websites, and through social media, uh, creating virtually an instant audience. When my fellowship ended, I decided to keep at it. I continued to write a weekly column, giving it away for free, hoping that somehow new streams of income would find me through speeches and other special projects. Once again, I'm incredibly blessed because somehow, so far, it continues to work. I bring up this history for a reason, a context for what I'm about to say. I'm naturally an optimist. I look for ways to make the best out of any situation, to type ideas on a blank page. But for the next few minutes, I'm going to be pretty gloomy. I'm not a politician or an economist, and I'm a writer. And because of that, I look at things differently and sometimes in a broader sense of the word. So it won't bother me at all if you think what I have to say is uh, full of it and just pass on it today. We know from our history that the relationship between the United States has gone through dramatic swings involving tribal governments. All of us here have only lived through two such eras, the termination era and self-determination. I believe we've entered a new era, a new period, when I call the era of contraction. At the beginning of the removal era, Elias Boudinot, the editor of the Cherokee Phoenix, wrote that it was his duty, quote, to reflect upon the dangers with which we are surrounded, to view the darkness which seems to lie before our people, 
our prospects, and the evils with which we are threatened, to talk over all these matters, and, if possible, come to some definite and satisfactory conclusion. The evils with which we are threatened. Tough words for tough times. I've been thinking about the why of that message. What would compel policymakers in that century to be so absolutely inhumane? Well, it turns out that one answer, one that's relevant today, is when the economy is lousy, people in general are less generous. They are angry and they do unspeakable things. The beginning of the removal era, it turns out, was one of those times. Economic recessions in 1825, 1828, and 1833 were marked by stock market crashes, trade wars, and an absolute credit contraction. The allotment era, the attempt to break up and steal Indian homeland, was also during a long depression. In fact, it was called the Long Depression, a contraction that lasted from 1873 to 1896, far longer than the Great Depression. The era of the Indian Reorganization Act is more complicated. Those reforms were proposed in the 1920s before the Great Depression, but as the Depression spread under President Hoover, federal spending on Indian-related programs dropped from $26 million a year in 1932, a 15% cut, and then a year later would cut again to $19 million, an additional 13% drop in essential services. President Roosevelt increased funding for Indian programs during the Great Depression, and this is a, a historical exception. Remember, in 1937, the economy contracted more sharply than it did during the stock market crash of 1929. The termination era has also economic consequences. The period after World War II was not technically a recession, but government spending was sharply curtailed because of debt and the cost of the war. No era begins or ends on a certain date. Even after termination was rejected, Congress never went back and undid the damage. Thus, laws such as Public Law 280 remain on the books. But how do we know? How do we know if this is a new era? Congress enacted House Resolution 108 on August 1, 1953, officially beginning the era of termination. This dreadful policy was supposed to abolish federal supervision over American Indian tribes and subject tribal members to state and county authority. Yet termination itself didn't take off as a policy until the 1950s and 60s. It was a terrible idea that slowly evolved. It was a similar shift when President Nixon announced the new policy of self-determination without termination. On July 8, 1970, Nixon said, we had begun to act on the basis of what the Indians themselves have long been telling us, that the time has come to break decisively with the past and to create the conditions for a new era in which the Indian future is determined by Indian acts and Indian decisions. Five years later, Congress enacted the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. And so it goes. A policy begins and it slowly evolves into a larger one. And I think that's the same with this new policy of contraction, one that will impact tribal governments and Indian people for years to come. It probably started some time ago, but the actual policy implications remain distant, almost more of a threat than a destructive force. The era of contraction has nothing to do with Indian country and everything to do with Indian country. This is a policy course that's set and already based on a terrible idea that, like termination, will evolve into a disastrous policy. This era of contraction is certain because we have already changed the way we live and our politics, and both Republicans and Democrats have bought into the premise. Let's talk for a minute what defines this era, at least outside of Washington politics, in terms of a few larger trends. The most important trend, I believe, is demographic and, and global. Everywhere on this planet, people are living longer than ever before. 
And that simple fact changes everything. Today, one in 10 people globally are over 60 years old. 40 years from now, now that number doubles to one in five. By then, if current contends, trends continue, there will be more people over 60 than there will be children. Remember, these are numbers are worldwide, but the numbers are even more stark in the United States. You've probably seen the recent ads on TV, we are 50 million strong, don't cut our Medicare. Well, a few numbers. Every 50 seconds, somebody turns 50. 55 million people are over 55, and 34 million are over 65. Both those numbers will double by 2030. Indian country is growing older too, only down the road, and more on that in a minute. My point is that much of what we think of as a political debate is really boils down to a question about the sustainability of the United States and how our demographic future requires us to make changes that are very difficult. The current debate, the one that defines the era of contraction, misses that point. The debate focuses on the massive debts of the United States, even though this is a global issue, not just a national one. My friend, Diane Lim Rogers, who is the former chief economist for the House Budget Committee and now at the Concord Co Coalition, points out that even if the United States erased all of our debts somehow, magically they just disappeared, we would still have a sustainability problem. She writes in her blog, the minute we erase those debts, our debt would start accumulating again because of the dynamics of the fiscal outlook. They're all wrong. Promised entitlement benefits will still be growing faster than the economy and the ability of revenues to pay for it. Sustainability is not the defining measure of our discourse. Instead, the debate is mostly on the margins, focusing on domestic federal spending programs, the very programs that meet so much to people living in Indian country. The result of that is that severe austerity is our future. It's one thing to think about budget cuts as an abstract phrase. It's quite another to think about those when services are eliminated, steady jobs disappear, and young people's ambitions are blocked because college is no longer accessible. Federal spending, of course, boils down to three types of accounts. Net interest, mandatory spending, programs that automatically qualify, such as Medicare and Medicaid, and discretionary spending. Interest on the debt gets paid no matter what. Congress cannot cut that. The super committee will likely propose at least modest cuts to discretionary spending. The third part of the budget, discretionary spending, including the cost of the military. But most of the attention, even if it's the smallest number, centers on domestic dis discretionary spending, which funds everything from transportation to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Tribal governments are at the very end of the rhetoric, rhetoric that defines public policy. The arguments about what to cut, how much to cut, centers on the very smallest slice of the pie. At least during the Obama administration, both the BIA and the IHS have avoided any deep cuts. But I believe that direction is going to sharply change over the next few years. As all of you know, Indian country is at risk because of the politics policy of contraction. We risk a total economic collapse. It's as, as if policymakers want to see how bad things can get on reservations and in native communities where too much of the economy is already suffering. The policy advocate is to significantly reduce government funding, reducing or eliminating the only good jobs paying available other than natural resources, and hope for the best. In the larger economy, that mantra is that the private sector will pick up the pieces. But that is total fiction in remote Alaska villages or on Indian reservations because there is no significant private sector. The vast majority of the jobs are connected to government. Ideally, Indian country would get some sort of exception to this policy of contraction, a hold harmless provision. And that's happening just a little bit. You see it in support from Republicans in Congress to protect the BIA or IHS budgets. 
But the problem is that tribal government's funding now comes from such a variety of government programs that cuts to community health clinics are nearly as important as direct IHS funding. The other problem with this policy of contraction is that Congress no longer decides these issues. They're more and more shifting to a process of automatic cuts that are determined by formula rather than by individual items. So how do tribes prepare for this wave? The most important thing, I think, is to consider it an opportunity. The tide of austerity, the era of contraction, will occur whether we like it or not. So the choices are to fight the inevitable or to embrace a future that will look very different than the one we're in now. It's natural to fight for what was promised by the United States through solemn treaties. It's a strategy that's worked before, at least in recent history. But if you look at the whole history of the United States, that's not true. Valid treaties were ignored during the eras of termination, allotment, relocation, and even during good times. Moreover, the scale of this wave threatens the very foundation of the United States itself, making it difficult, if not impossible, to secure something for such a small population. This is even more difficult when you consider that the United States does not know what to do about these structural issues. The divide in our plan ahead is as great now as it was during, say, the Civil War. Again, so how do tribal governments prepare and adapt to the era of contraction? First, I think it's important to continue to do what you do. Make the case as best you can that federal programs and dollars make sense. I think the treaty and constitutional arguments make a great deal of sense. At the same time, behind the scenes, perhaps think about these few ideas, many of which are already being done by tribal governments across the country. First, look at tribal budgets with fresh eyes. What costs can be trimmed? How best you protect services and employees during a downturn? What other resources might be there? How can you protect your tribal general fund, your cash? History is clear about this. During a contraction, cash is the most important economic resource. Walk through tribal offices. How many of the people in those buildings work through government contracts? What does it mean if 10% of that funding goes away? What about 15? What about 20? What kind of transition could be made to make that easier? Can something be done now? Another thing to remember about this era is that state and local governments are going to be hit by the same wave. A new report from the nonprofit State Budget Solutions estimates the state's debt at $4 trillion. There are other estimates that are lower, but I think you have to look at what the assumption is, and I think this one is actually pretty close. This, too, is both a threat and an opportunity for tribal governments. It's a threat because state and counties will be looking for more revenue and they will turn to Indian country and try to get everything they can. They will try to tax tribes in ways that they have not before and look for any opening they can, including property and revenue of tribal enterprises, tribal members, and other places that are now off limits. It's also a threat because under current law, states set the rules for Medicaid. It's a strange system. The federal government pays 100% of the cost, yet it's the states that make the rules for that. That, too, might be an opportunity because the case can be made that it's in the state's interest to build a stronger Indian health system. I believe that before this era of austerity ends, many of the questions, the very basic assumptions about government will be asked. What happens when there are not enough funds for a police shift? What happens if there's not enough to pave a highway? Or which state will be the first one to cut loose a public university? Already some local governments are in bankruptcy and it's not inconceivable that states will be there first, will be there as well. The demand for basic services could be an important building block for better cooperation between tribes and local governments. Broke governments are more open to partnerships. Smart governments will look for ways to leverage services 
instead of engaging in expensive litigation with tribes with the only goal, a duplication of services. I believe that tribes should prepare for the worst. We need to look through the impact of contraction policies and look for ways to protect people during the coming downturn. One policy that I would recommend as part of that is transparency. We have to be more open about what tribes do, what our priorities are, and how scarce resources serve our communities. In the age of social media, transparency is a valuable resource. Transparency also opens the door to innovation. If people know the problems, the challenges, then well, as Elias Boudinot put it, we can talk over these matters and if possible, come to some definite and satisfactory conclusion. I think every tribe should also have a foreign policy. What are the foreign policy goals for the tribal community? What are possible trade relationships? What is required to make that so? and what's necessary to get secure funding from overseas. Is there a designated person within the tribal council or other government function whose job it is to build international relationships with other governments? Here, Indian country has a great advantage that's not true in the rest of the United States. Our infrastructure is already built using, quote, state-owned enterprises. We call them tribal enterprises and they range from farms to hotels and casinos. We already know how government investment can create jobs at a fair return to government. That's not an, an ob a concept that the rest of the world, that's a common concept in the rest of the world. Another idea, one that I would do quickly, as in as soon as you go home, is start a community foundation. It's essential for tribes to build new revenue streams finding money from both government and private resources. The law already allows divisions of tribal governments to act as 501c3 nonprofits. But to do that, we need to build assets before the deepest cuts come that can be used to support and fund tribal priorities. How do you raise money for a foundation? Every tribe spends money with vendors, whether a government program, business, or casino. Go down the list, be methodical, any company or individual who does business with a tribe should be given, as they say in fundraising circles, the opportunity to help launch a new community foundation. Some tribes might focus their nonprofit organizations on healthcare or scholarships, all valuable enterprises. But the key to me is to create new revenue streams that could continue to build community while the United States is busy shrinking. I want to close by talking about what I see as the most important opportunity, and that is young people. As I mentioned earlier, demographics are much of the context for our challenges. But for Indian country, this is also our greatest opportunity. The median age in the United States is 43 years old. That is, half the population is older and half is younger. That number is rising every year. Indian country, on the other hand, has a median age of 30. And of that, about 30% of American Indians and Alaska Natives are younger than 18. Only 8% are 65 and older. This is very different than the profile of the United States. It's an opportunity handed to us. But to take advantage of that opportunity, that gap, we must invest in young people like we never have before. We need to make absolutely sure that all the education programs, from schools to colleges to training program, have the resources necessary to create an environment for success. We need to be creative and recognize that young people are more essential now than ever. We need to live this principle. We need to act like our very lives are at stake, and they are. It may be impossible to know when exactly the era of contraction began. But I know for certain that it's here. This is an era defined by global trends that have very little to do with Indian country. But it's a wave so huge that it will change everything we do. We cannot count on the federal government in ways that we have taken granted since the era of self-determination began in the 1970s. Indian country must once again adapt to a new relationship with the federal government 
then we know how to do that. Native people have faced, survived policies of extermination, removal, allotment. Millions of acres of land have been stolen, and yet we're still here. Again, as Elias Boudinot said, survival starts when we reflect upon the dangers with which we are surrounded, to view the darkness which seems to lie before our people, our prospects, and the evils with which we are threatened, to talk over these matters and, if possible, come to some definite and satisfactory conclusion. I started by saying I'm an optimist. I remain so, especially if we reflect on our prospects and plan for a different kind of future, taking full advantage of the opportunities that lie before our people. Thank you.